All right. In this video, I want to talk about turning from sin. What a lot of people call repentance. I've actually been talking to some Catholics and Seventh-day Adventists about this. And they seem to have a big misunderstanding, right? Because we're told to repent and believe the gospel, repent and be baptized, repent, repent, repent. And their mindset of what repentance is is not biblical. Because I'll talk to a woman, they'll say, well, repentance, you got to feel sorry for your sin. You got to feel sorry, you got to feel bad about it, and you got to want to turn away from it and stop doing it, right? That's what they'll say repentance is. But we can read in Hebrews chapter 12 about Esau, who was crying and felt bad about his sin and saw on his birthright. But he found no place for repentance. Now, if repentance is feeling sorry and all this stuff about your sin, then Esau repented. But it says he found no place for repentance. And not only that, we read about God repenting of wanting to destroy Jerusalem or Israel or even Nineveh. Right? He repents from doing these things. It's not necessarily God feeling sorry and bad about the evil he was going to do. He even calls it evil because evil is destruction. What he was going to do was destroy. And he repents of it. Right? So that shows that repentance is not turning from sin. Because God wasn't going to sin, but he still repented. And that's because of people's misunderstanding of what repentance really is. And there's only one real way to actually turn from your sin, right? Now let me explain. You may feel sorry and regret for the things you have said and done in your life. And you wish you didn't, you wish you could take them back and you, change, you could change them, but you can't, right? And you make an effort to do better and to stop sinning, all right? Guess what? You didn't turn from sin. You may even sin less than you have, but you didn't turn from sin because you are a sinner, and to turn from sin, you would have to actually turn from yourself. Because we always sin. We keep on sinning because that's what we are, sinners. Right? Such as in Luke 18, Jesus talks about uh, two people coming into the temple. One of them, a Pharisee. Right? Just like how these Catholics and Orthodox in Seventh Day Adventist Act, where they're like, you know, thank you, God, for not making me like these other sinners, like this guy who's in here, and all this stuff, and yada yada yada. And the the other guy who was in the temple doesn't even look up because he's ashamed of himself, and he just says, "God have mercy on me, a sinner." And he knows what he is. He's not even gonna really try to make anything about himself sound good, right? Like, hey, I, I did some of these good things, you know, I'm trying to do better. He's just like, no, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. And Jesus said, this is the one who went away justified. The one who admits that he's a sinner, right? So to truly turn from sin is not to feel sorry for what you've done and to make an effort to stop sinning, to keep the law and to do good works, because you still sin because you're a sinner, like Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7. Verses 14 through 24, I think, is a good area where he talks about how there's no good thing in his flesh. We're all carnal, and 
the flesh gets us to do things that we don't want to do and keeps us from doing the things that we want to do, right? And he says that it's not him that sins, but sin that dwells within him. So you see, he makes a differentiation between him, his soul, and his flesh, that the flesh, the body, that he ends up saying, who's going to save me from this, this wretched body of death and sin? And that's where he thanks Jesus Christ, right? And that's because truly turning from sin is to admit you're a sinner and to lay that at the cross, your life there. Not thinking you can do anything to make up for what you've done or that you even actually need to. Because there's people who are saved in spite of them not feeling sorry for what they've done. As it, as uh, I believe it's Jude who talks about saving some by fear, right? And some of these people don't even preach any fear. Like Seventh-day Adventists, they preach what the atheists already believe, that when they die, they're nothing. And they're like, yeah, that's what happens. God's going to turn you into nothing because of your sin. You're not going to exist. You're going to enter this eternal sleep, eternal rest of death even though the wicked have no rest day or night. They don't teach them of hell, where you spit in the face of the eternal God. There's eternal consequences for that. You don't just walk away. You don't just do what you did to Jesus and walk away from it and go rest. They don't put the fear of God in you whatsoever by telling you, oh yeah, God's just going to burn you up and into nothing may suffer for a bit, but it ends up ending, right? It takes the fear of God out of it. It's like, oh, I can do that. I can do that to the Son of God. And then eventually I go into this eternal rest where I don't have to exist anymore. Right? So to truly turn from sin is your past, present, and future, your life, you lay it on the cross, you give it to Jesus, where he can pay for it. Because only God can pay for your sins and walk away from it. Because only God, an eternal being, can pay for a infinite penalty and still have enough to keep going. Right? So that's what Jesus did. And now... That you have done this, Jesus then gives you his perfect eternal life in exchange. But you see, a lot of people are very prideful. These Catholics and Orthodox and Seventh-day Adventists and others, but these are the main ones, these are the main ones that I talk to, that have this pride and this arrogance to them where they think, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as all these other people. And I do a lot of good things for my family and uh, community in my country, and for God, and I go to church, and I do these things, I'm going to be led into heaven, right? They're not turning from sin, even though they're doing good, because they're still upholding themselves a sinner as if they're worthy of God and eternal life, when they're not. None of us are, and none of us can be. Our righteousness is as filthy rags to God, because it has to be perfect where we have no sin whatsoever. And if we're doing all these things for ourselves, that's a sin. Because the law is loving God with all you got and loving your fellow man as yourself it has nothing to do with you. So if you're doing these things to escape hell, to earn heaven and have eternal life, you're all, you just tainted every good thing you're doing with selfishness, making it sin. So you need to accept what God has offered, his life, which is better than anything you can ever do anyway. So why not accept it? Why are you going to reject God's gift to you, which is Jesus Christ and his perfect life, to keep yours? Even if you're not that bad of a person in the eyes of you know, men and women, why would you hold on to that over receiving Jesus' life in this kid? 
Why? Do you really think your life is better than Jesus' life and what he's willing to give you? Do you really think that? That's some pride and some arrogance. So to turn from sin, you need to truly repent. And that's what I'll close up the video by explaining what true repentance is. When we come over here to Mark chapter 1, at verse 14, it says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Now, how a lot of people read this as repent, oh, turn from, feel sorry for your sins, and turn from your sins and stop sinning, and believe the gospel. When that's not what this word repent means, we can use the scriptures to show, as I talked about, God repented. And there's all kinds of instances, such as this one, where it has nothing to do with turning from your sin or feeling sorry for your sins. It has to do with unbelief going to belief. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Turn from your unbelief to belief. And we see this with the actual Greek definition of the word here. Metanol oye. I don't know, met, N-O-I, yeah, I'm not going to try again, but uh, yeah, there it is, you can try to pronounce it, met, N-O-A-O, met, N-A-O, met, N-O-A-O, that was my last try, anyway, it says, to change one's mind or purpose, I repent, change mind, change the inner man, particularly with reference to accepting the will of God, repent. Change after being with, uh, change of mind, uh, think differently afterwards, right? And uh, a real good example of this is the two thieves on the cross who were mocking Jesus. One of them kept mocking Jesus. The other one repented. Now, he didn't necessarily feel sorry for his sins. He didn't actually turn from sinning. I mean, he was nailed to a cross, and there's not much he could really do, right? I guess you could say he stopped mocking Jesus. But what actually happened is he repented. He went in his heart from unbelief to belief. So he did what Jesus said here and repented and believed the gospel. Because you look at that thief who believed on Jesus, and you have to sit in his shoes. You're you're naked, nailed to a cross. And you see this guy beaten and humiliated, covered in blood, where he, he doesn't even look like a, a man anymore. He's that mutilated. And they nail him to a cross, and they throw him up there. And he's sitting there saying, looking up to heaven, saying, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And this thief on the cross says, Lord! Remember me when you come into your kingdom. A beaten, humiliated man nailed to a cross, he's calling Lord. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. When he's dying. That shows he believes. He repented. Because he's seeing this guy and he's like, this is God. Because there's a sign above his head. It's in Latin, it's in Greek, and it's in Hebrew. And in the Hebrew, where it says, here is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. In the Hebrew, you would see Yeshua, which is yod heh vav -Heh, our salvation. And yod heh vav -Heh means behold the hand, behold the nail. So he's looking there, and he sees this man saying, looking up, saying, forgive them for they know what they do. And he sees, yod heh vav -Heh, our salvation, king of the Jews. And king of the Jews would remind you of the Torah. The letters for the Torah tell you of the high one nailed to a tav. So you see, yod heh vav -Heh, behold the hand, behold the nail. And then the king of the Jews... Torah, the instructions that Moses wrote, the writings, the, the, the Old Testament. 
the high one nailed to a tav, and he's nailed to a cross, because a tav is like a T, a cross. So he sees this beaten, bloody man dying, and he reads the sign, and he's like, Lord, I recognize you. I, 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 I see who you are. You're here before me. You're the Lord. I know it. He right that's a repent that's a change right there, right? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's turning from sin. Right before that he's telling the other thief, Hey, we deserve what we're going through. So you see how he's saying, I'm a sinner. I deserve this. This guy right here, he doesn't deserve it. He doesn't, we do. And you, the other thief's mocking him to save him. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He just didn't accept it. Jesus was sitting there saving him right then and there, but he didn't see it, didn't acknowledge it. Like Jesus told the Pharisees, you would have believed me, but the word of my Father is not in your heart. And you can see the two types of people as the two people crucified next to Jesus. That represents all of humanity. The people who rejected him and the people who accepted him. The people who have accepted him have his word in his heart, in their heart. So that's how you're born again. Peter tells us, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, that you're born again of uncorruptible seed, the word of God, which is the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. You believe that in your heart, the moment you do, Ephesians 1, 13 says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And Ephesians 4, 30 says you're sealed until the day of redemption, which means you're, you're set. Because once you're born again, once you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, you're saved. You can't be unborn again. You can't be unsealed. And if it were possible for you to be unborn again and to be unsealed by the Spirit of God and be lost once you were saved, then you're lost. Because Jesus would have to come into the world again, go through everything he went through again, and die for you again so that you could be born again again and resealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You can't get your salvation, lose it, get it back, lose it, get it back, lose it. That can't happen. Because every time you get it back, you would have to re-crucify Jesus. So if you think you lost it, then you, you can't get it back. It's done. It's gone. You're either saved or you're not. It's not a back and forth thing. And if you're not saved, get saved. So with that being said, thanks for watching and take care.